Speaker Murphy is not well. He's been ill for some time now. So we remember him in the prayer. He was a great Georgian. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll enjoy learning about him. Uh, today we have uh, a forum on the lobbying and uh, its effect on the development of public policy in both the state and the federal levels. Plus, we're going to look and see what role money plays in the election of our public officials. There is in Washington, D.C., what is known as a revolving door, which is sometimes referred to as the journey from Congress to K Street. Now, K Street in Washington is the, is the location of some of the nation's most powerful law firms as well as lobbying companies. And, and the employees of these firms, both law firm and lobbying firms, are former congressmen who have worked when they left the Congress as lobbyists in Washington. And they have become so powerful that they're often referred to as, the title of our forum today, the invisible government. And the same really applies to state level. At the state level, the same thing goes on. Uh, a common sight here in the legislature, as you'll learn later, uh, is a lobbyist walking up and down the halls looking for a legislator to attempt to persuade or to accept his or her point of view. That's lobbying. And as we look at money in politics, we're going to consider the Political Action Committee, uh, which is a, a series of, uh, of, uh, com of people with common interests that have been organized to defeat or elect public officials uh, to, promote, to promote their own agenda or their own personal interests. Now let's look for a minute at uh, the definition of the term lobby. It was supposed to have originated in the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. when Grant was president. And it was called lobbying because people would meet him in the lobby of the hotel to discuss with him their interests in what was happening in the country. That is where it originated. But the definition is, according to the Collaborative International Dictionary of English, says to lobby is to address or solicit members of a legislative body in the lobby <coughs> or elsewhere with the purpose to influence their votes, which in an extended sense to try to influence decision makers in any circumstances. Now that's the, that's the official uh, dictionary uh, definition. Politicians and bureaucrats usually use another definition. And to them, a lobbyist is a soft touch with an unlimited expense account. <laughs> <coughs> or a corporate official with access, access to a large political action committee. Or an every ever ready hat and coat man transportation, <laughs> or a quick source of free tickets to major <laughs> events, or to the sponsors of trip, uh, trips and junkets to exotic places, and last of all, a well-rounded sack. <laughs> <laughs> But regardless of the definition you prefer, the fact is that lobbying state and federal governments in the United States today has become a major, major industry. The number of registered lobbyists in Washington alone, Washington alone has doubled since 2000. Up until that point, uh, lobbying really had been fairly reactive. And by that I mean that most lobbyists were hired to fend off proposals that 
that cost their, their clients money. But that's no longer the case. In Washington today, corporations look for successful lobbyists that can show them ways to make profits from the many tax breaks, government handouts, and other goodies that are there to be found and to be taken. Now, for the purpose of this meeting, I researched to find out who is spending money for lobbyists in both Washington and Georgia. Who is getting it? And you may be interested, as I was, in what I found. The biggest spender for lobbying services in Washington, D.C. is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Last year, that business association paid out almost $39 million for lobbying services. And following that, in order, was the American Association of Retired Persons, which spent almost $28 million, General Electric, which spent $24 million, the American Medical Association, which spent $19 million, and the U.S. Telecom Association, which spent $17 that group composed of five top spenders. After that, there was very little decline in the amount of money that the organizations and companies spent all the way to the top 200 in the nation. All total spending on lobbying services in the United States increased from $1.43 billion in 1998 to $2.28 billion. 2005. According to the American Center for Responsive Politics, which is a nonpartisan research group based in Washington. Now, let's take a look at who got the money. The top lobbying firms in Washington, D.C. The number one was Patton Boggs, P-A-T-T-O-N, Boggs, uh, which uh, is a, a lobbying company there that was formed by the son of the former Speaker of the House uh, in Washington. Uh, you might remember him. He was Hale Boggs, Louisiana. And Representative Boggs was lost in a plane accident in Alaska many years ago. But it's interesting when you look at the Boggs firm to note that it has hired a number of former Capitol Hill and Capitol Hill employees who use their federal experience on behalf of their clients. The most noted among them, I could add, is Senator John Rowe, who decided uh, in 2004 cycle not to run again. Uh, he went to work uh, for uh, the Boggs firm and is now one of the major lobbyists in that firm. Uh, among the many clients that the, the Patton Boggs firm has is the city of Atlanta, Georgia, which, which pays them $80,000 a year just to look after the city's interest in Washington. That, that is not a common either. Most major cities in the country hire these lobbyists to do what we've already said, to go out and look for ways to, to get on the federal payroll. The second top connected firm in Washington is Cassidy & Associates, which collected almost $26 million 2005 and claimed second spot. The company belongs to a large national conglomerate of companies uh, with offices in Washington, Moscow, and Brussels. It represents in this country uh, Russian and foreign clients before the federal government. Now, its website says uh, it works with clients to secure congressional funding lobbying legislation and guiding clients to the regulatory process to promote relationships with federal officials. Former uh, United States Representative Martin Russo of Illinois is vice chairman of the company. Former New York Representative Jack, Jack Quinn is president of the company. Several other major <coughs> fe former federal employees work for the company. Third in 
headline was the Van Soyak Association with most with almost $25 million. That firm has probably taken more advantage of the revolving door than any other lobbying company in Washington. And this line up reads like a payment to a former official, federal government official. Uh, not surprisingly, this, this line up is composed almost entirely of employees who came from Capitol Hill through the revolving door to K Street. One came from the House Ways and Means Committee, which is a very powerful committee, as you may know, in the House of Representatives. Two others came from the Department of Defense, which, as you know, is the site where many, many federal contracts are left in the defense field. One came from the White House. Another came from, uh, uh, after serving 11 years on the House Appropriations Committee, as you know, is a key committee because it handles the money. Another was hired from the staff of the uh, Senate Budget Committee. And uh, I could go on and on, but I think you, you get the point. The fourth person, I'm sorry, the fourth largest Wayne wage earner was Duck Coal Worldwide, which raked in more than $20 million in 2005, according to OpenSecrets.org on the internet. That firm is headed by Ron Kaufman, who was chosen by Ronald Reagan to be director of the National Republican, Republican Committee following Reagan's defeat by Jimmy Carter in 1980. Defeat of Jimmy Carter, I'm sorry. Way, Reagan <laughs> he was later named uh, by President, first President Bush to head his uh, 1984 election team. And the fifth largest firm in Washington that lobbies is Barbara Griffith and Roger. Uh, which uh, took in almost 19 million uh, in 2005, <laughs> including Iraq's Kurdish Democratic Party. As the name Barbara seems to me to be sure, the same gentleman who was the chairman of the National Republican Party and now is the governor of the state of Mississippi. Uh, the, uh, another principal in that firm is Ed Rogers, who <laughs> Deputy Assistant to George H.W. Bush. These are the five most successful lobbying firms in Washington. But they're not only the profitable ones. The remaining groups that compose the top 20 firms rose more than $1.3 billion in 2005. I cannot give you the figures on 2006 uh, because it now, let's quickly take a look at who paid them for their lobbying service. Uh, top spenders, we we'll call them. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is at the top of the list. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce spent almost $39 million to lobbying firms during 2005. The second big spender was AARP which protected its interest by laying out almost $28 million. Third was General Electric with $25 million. Fourth was the Medical Association, U.S. Medical Association, with $20 million. And the Telecom Administration Association, which we mentioned earlier, was $16 and a half. It's important, I think, to, to tell you that Go down one more to the sixth uh, highest spender. That was the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association of America. Now, it's important, I think, to point out the fact that spending on lobby services in Washington varies uh, from year to year simply because the issue is different and the critical legislation that affects these industries. Might not pop up. <coughs> and because, of course, they exert their financial influence 
much as they can on the legislature. In the case of the, of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association uh, in 2004 and 2005, you will recall that the debate in Washington was the uh, debate over drug benefits for, for, uh, for Medicare patients, plus the importation of ex exported drugs to Canada. And they fought that and fought it tremendously. And uh, might, you'll learn later about how you lobby. Uh, they didn't win at all. But they weren't uh, they were happy. I don't know whether or not they were going to get the money for it. Now, we talked about like the givers and the givers. Now I'd like to mention the political action committee and the finance and candidates, both at the state and the federal level. And I think it's also important to understand that the rules regarding political action committees at the state and the federal level are quite different. The reporting systems are a bit different as are the lobby registration uh, requirements. Uh, political action committees were started uh, by the American labor movement uh, years ago uh, when the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which you full timers like me would remember, the CIO, uh, and uh, uh, started a, a political action committee with no guidance or direction and with no prohibition, no regulations from the, from the federal government. In 1943, that same organization started a new voluntary uh, pact, which it called the, the, its political action committee, and it was known as COPE, the Committee on Political Education. That was formed by the CIO and the American Federation of Labor. Other PACs that we have today, such as the American Medical Political Action Committee, which is called MPAC, and Georgia's called uh, GPAC, I believe it, uh, was formed during the 50s and the 60s. Uh, but uh, it took federal legislation in around 1970 uh, to, to enable corporations and organizations to, to have their own PACs. And that was, uh, that was uh, under the provisions of what was known as the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, which specifically allowed corporations to use their money to set up political action committees to contribute to federal candidates. Now, uh, the, the limit set on the, the amount of money that PACs can contribute uh, to individual political campaign is $5,000. And there's a personal limit on individual contributions from candidates per election. Uh, that means that the limit is $5,000 to a candidate that's running for Congress. You can give that candidate $5,000 for the primary, $5,000 for the runoff, and $5,000 in the general election, which means that, that the limit really is fifteen thousand dollars if the the campaign goes through the general election. Uh, so the bigger tax. Uh, Center for Responsible Politics tells us that Emily's list, which as you may know, is a, an organization dedicated exclusively to the election female candidates. Reported total expenditures of $30,000 less than $30 million for the last election. That is from the Center for Responsive Politics. Move on to uh, an organization that you heard of during the last election uh, and was uh, created, uh, I think, simply to defeat George W. Bush. Spent slightly more than $27 million last term election. The Service Employees International is third with $30.5 million. 
American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees was fourth. And coming together, which I'm sure you saw on the last advertising for the presidential day, and another group that was uh, that was sought that sought to defeat President Bush, spent 15 million dollars and was the fifth largest contributor. Uh, that group, incidentally, was uh, started by a philanthropist George Soros, uh, who was well known as a money man, rich fellow who wanted to, to win uh, the election so badly, he was a major contributor to that, to that group. Now, I'd like to look uh, for a minute at the benefactors of uh, corporate spending, pack money. Uh, starting with the Senate, uh, it would probably come as no surprise to you Hillary Clinton in New York was the leading money raiser during the last uh, election cycle. Uh, Senator Clinton raised $47 million, $612 in her bid for re-election to the Senate in the state of New York. Uh, the funds came from uh, a variety of sources, uh, but most of the money Contributed by political action committee. Uh, obviously, you are interested in seeing her uh, elected president in 2008. The second most donated two candidate was uh, Rick Santoro, who was the third ranking member of the Republican leadership in the Senate, who was defeated by young Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, his father. Once it was, it was governor of Pennsylvania. His father had the same name. People thought they were voting for his father, I think. But Santorum was, uh, was defeated, uh, but he amassed uh, almost $25 million in that race. And a strange situation in Connecticut, Robert Lamont, who you remember, defeated incumbent Senator Joe Lieberman in the primary, raised uh, $20 million for his campaign. That was the third largest. Uh, among the fundraisers and candidates. But the Lieberman, who came back and defeated Lamont in the general election as an independent, raised almost as much and was the fourth leading money raiser with 29 million. In the House of Representatives, the, 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 the representatives, senior representatives uh, who raised the most money were, were candidates for Congress. There was uh, Senator Harold Ford Jr. in Tennessee. There was a Democrat, uh, Robert Dan Menendez in uh, New Jersey. There was Catherine Harris in Florida. And there was a uh, Florida Republican, uh, Brother McCannon. Uh, and there was David McSweeney, uh, who, uh, who ran for the Senate uh, in uh, Illinois. <coughs> Strangely enough, the largest money raiser among the uh, members of the House of Representatives was the Speaker, who was no longer Speaker, uh, Mr. Haskell is his name, and he raised a little bit more than five million dollars in his campaign for the election. Uh, so, we've got the givers, the makers, <coughs> Now I'd like to talk a minute about uh, the most powerful forces in the lobby business in Washington, D.C. And it might surprise you. The, the recent poll of 329 Washington insiders named the AARP as the most powerful lobbying force in the country. That's no surprise since the organization claims to have at least 33 million loyal members who get out and vote. It also points out that money 
is not always the biggest factor in winning elections. In 2006, according to uh, the same source, senior citizens accounted for 52% of the voters that turned out in November elections. 18% of them switched from supporting Republicans and voting for Democrats. And what makes this, what makes the senior citizens most valuable to political candidates is that the vast majority tend to be independent voters. And the statistics from the AARP show that nine out of 10 Republicans nationwide voted for Republican candidates in the last election. Nine of every ten Democrats who voted for uh, in the past the general election voted for Democrats. While independent voters voted overwhelmingly for the Democratic candidates, 55% to 41%. So uh, to me that means that, that the federal organization is quite justified in saying that they swung of the election. <clears throat> All right, going down the line, uh, run-up organizations in the most powerful uh, survey uh, by the independent survey organizations in Washington was the AFL-CIO, the National Federation of Independent Businesses. The Association of Trial Lawyers, the National Rifle Association, the Christian Coalition, the American Medical Association, and the National Education Association. Others that made sizable contributions, the realtors, bankers, manufacturers, government employees, <coughs> veterans of foreign wars, farmers, filmmakers, home builders, and broadcasters. And that's your top 20. Uh, I read an article not long ago by a Fortune magazine writer by the name of Jeffrey Greenbaum, which got my attention. And he observed that the powerhouse of persuasion, powerhouses of persuasion, aren't very visible above the Washington waterline, but they are very big, very menacing. He believes that while their nations are still crucial, they aren't the only keys to the kingdom. These days, interest organizations are valued more for the votes they can deliver. He admits, however, that three of the top ten organizations owe their high ranking to the substantial campaign contribution to the association of trial lawyers, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and the American Medical Association. So let's for a minute go back to the revolving door. Clients who hire uh, lobbying firms in Washington place a very high premium on those who have former members of Congress on their payroll. I mentioned the uh, public interest group, public citizen. According to that organization, 86 members have left Congress since 1998 to lobby their former colleagues. That's about 43% of all retired members who left for reasons other than seeking another office or to other jobs in the cause of death. The revolving door. And as the number of ex-congresspersons arrive on the scene in Washington, so does the amount of compensation that lobbyists receive. Uh, that same survey showed that the average pay for a lobbyist nowadays is $300,000 a year, compared to $100,000 a year uh, in the early so I've learned more than a million. For example, Bob Dole, you remember Bob Dole, former senator of Kansas, former candidate for, candidate for uh, president. Uh, Bob Dole took a job with uh, an Atlanta law firm, Austin and Bird, uh, at a salary of 
already here. Representative Billy Tawson of Louisiana, who stopped and quit the Senate uh, this past term, uh, is even better. Uh, he resigned his seat in March 2004 and immediately took a job working in, in a lobby firm for $2 million which most, a year, which most people think so well. And despite uh, the fact that they also practice law, many Washingtons of Washington's high power lawyers uh, are lobbyists. Jack Quinn, who you might remember, was the attorney, White House attorney who defended President Clinton during the impeachment hearings, and left the White House to form a lobbying firm with Ed Gillespie who is a Republican friend and former House Majority Leader Tom DeLay. Uh, the firm, Quinn Gillespie, uh, had the right idea that if you put a Democrat with a Republican, then these corporations could do one-stop shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and they would have contacts in each of the parties. You might remember Jody Powell, who was press secretary to Governor Carter. Jody Powell and Sheila Tate, who, who worked as a spokesperson for Nancy Reagan, founded their own firm uh, and hired these people. The chief of staff and the office of Senator Edward Kennedy And Powell's own friends from the White House, who are now in the firm called Powell Tate, Weber, Sandwick. Some of their clients you might be interested in know, is the Saudi Economic and Development Corporation. Hooters. <laughs> Food line. The Japanese Whaling Association and the New Zealand government. Also, Mike McCurry, who you will remember as President Clinton's press secretary, is a, is a partner at the firm Public Strategies in Washington. So are his successor at the White House, Joe Lockhart. So is Al Gore's top strategist, <coughs> Carter Eskew. And so is Howard Wolfson, former chief of staff to Senator Charles Schumer and Senator Hillary Clinton. Uh, this activity, though, is not confined to Washington. In Georgia, 11 former members of Congress began a lobbying career after leaving office. The latest is Senator Miller, who took a job at Atlanta Law firm McKinney Law and Aldridge, who was entitled Senior Policy Advisor of the National Government. <coughs> Former Congressman Buddy Darden joined the same firm when he was defeated after serving six terms in the Congress. Also on the, the firm's lobbying team is Keith Mason, former Governor Miller's Executive Secretary and former Deputy Assistant to President Bill Clinton in Washington. Former ambassador to Canada, Gordon Giffen, <coughs> who heads up the firm's Washington office. And Alex Albert, former aide to Republican Senator Paul Coverdale, and chief of staff for Democratic Senator Bill. Former Congressman Max Burns of Sylvania, Bob Barr of Marietta, Ed Jenkins of Jasper, Billy Owens of Lake, Don Johnson of Boston, Elliot McGillis of Decatur, Dawson Mathis of Albany, Senator Mac Mattingly of St. Simons, and Richard Ray of Perry are either other, either other retired or defeated member of Congressman from Georgia who have revolved to the Saturday door. Former Speaker of Duke Gingrich has a company he calls Gingrich Communications. Two events in recent years have focused attention 
on members who leave the Congress or congressional staffs to become high-paid bodies. You might remember a Louisiana congressman by the name of Bob Livingston, who stepped down as speaker-elect of the House of Representatives and resigned his seat due to a sex scandal. Livingston has formed a company called the Livingston Group that is composed of former Congressman Thomas Coleman of Missouri, former Congressman Andy Israel, I'm sorry, Andy Ireland of Florida, former Congressman Ron P. Clink of Pennsylvania, former Congressman Anthony Moffitt of Connecticut, and former Congressman William Zeff of New Hampshire. As of last year, his firm has over 80 domestic and foreign clients and is based in Washington, D.C. with offices in New Orleans and several other locations around the world. According to that firm's website, in January of 2006, some of their most prominent clients include the City of New Orleans, George Washington University, Goodyear, Verizon, Tulane University, Rolls Royce, the Republic of Turkey, Oracle, North Rock Drummer, and Lockheed Martin, two airplane manufacturers that I would assume somewhere that allowed that be interested in some sort of business up there. Now, I'm sure you wondered what ever happened to John Ashcroft. Would you like to know what happened to John Ashcroft? John Ashcroft, after his resignation as Attorney General of the United States, formed a lobbying group in Washington called the Ashcroft Group. In only 10 months after he registered his firm, by federal law. Ashcroft claimed 20 major clients, among them are Art, Choice Point, eBay, IT&T, Mattel Steel, <coughs> which is the world's largest steel producer, and Israel Aircraft Industries. Of course, that move uh, you know, raised a few eyebrows among the media. Washington watchers who keep a pretty close eye on what goes on uh, And Ashcroft is, uh, is, has become one of the major Republican lobbying companies in, in Washington. But looking further into what's happening there, you'll see that uh, uh, the revolving door is not limited to former congressmen. There are dozens of highly paid lobbyists with family connections uh, in the Congress. For example, Joshua Haster, the son of former Speaker Dennis Haster, uh, is registered to lobby for Amgen, Biotech, Lockheed Martin, and several other defense contractors. The Public Citizens Congress Watch, which I mentioned earlier, uh, says that there are 32 relatives of members of Congress who are currently actively lobbying in Washington. Abigail Blunt, the wife of Congressman Roy Blunt of Missouri, lobbies for several major companies, including Bill Morris, Altria, and others. Former Senator Birch Bayh, who once was a candidate for president, Father of current Indiana Senator Evan Black lobbies for a Washington company called Villain, which has a array of corporate clients. The brother of Democrat John Murtha of Pennsylvania, Robert Murtha, lobbies for a number of corporate clients, including Jensen Corporation, a company that sells software to the Department of Defense. Kara Delahunt, the daughter of Massachusetts Democrat William Delahunt, is 
registered as an agent for the Saudi Economic and Development Company, which serves as an investment broker for consumers who put money in pet projects that adhere to Islamic law. Even former Democrat Majority Leader Tom Nashville, who I'm sure you will remember as a family collection connection, his wife Linda is registered as a lobbyist for firms such as Lockheed Martin. I can remember during the election cycle that, that uh, the fact that her that, that his wife was uh, employed in that job uh, hurt him very much over in, uh, in South Dakota in his attempt to be reelected. Now, there are many other. Loopholes. Why does loophole the law was created in late 2004? 
Court when the Office of Government Ethics approved a request by that department to split, to get this, this is Cajun, to split into seven components which allows former employees, once in the private sector, to lobby every other component except the one they worked in. All of this feeds uh, the American disgust of Washington. And it behooves the Congress to do something about it. You know, the House of Representatives got busy the other day and passed some ethics regulations that says you can't do this and you can't do that. But those were House rules. And those are not binding. Congress, uh, I'm sure, sometime during this session, we'll look into ethics law and attempt to come up with some solution to the many, many loopholes that exist. Now, I'm not saying that lobbying is bad. Quite the opposite. I think all lobbying is necessary. Uh, so, does, uh, so does our good friend Robert Byrd, uh, who, uh, who once spoke on the floor of the House about how necessary bodies are and how they play a vital role uh, in, in the legislative process in America. Uh, and I believe that's true. Uh, of course, there are good lobbyists and there are bad. Uh, today we have a good one as our guest. And he will be able to explain to you uh, some of the, the right way to do things. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy that. Uh, the, the reforms that they're talking about in Congress Probably will be uh, accepted and passed. And they probably will at least get the public off of, the, off of their ethics case, in which case uh, it will benefit everybody. Uh, we uh, often in, in Georgia uh, speak of how proud we are that we have very few, if any, uh, scandals. I don't know whether it's because uh, our lobbyists uh, are more ethical and our legislators are more fearful, or whether we just don't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in Georgia, there are 1,404 registered lobbyists, compared to 34,750 <coughs> in Washington. That means there are six lobbyists for every member of the Georgia General Assembly. And there's 65 for every member of Congress. <laughs> but there's also a revolving door in Georgia, not as busy as the one in Washington. There's a total of 41 former members of the Georgia House and Senate registered to lobbyists as lobbyists in 2005. Spending here is not nearly as much either. Uh, in Georgia, those 1,404 agents spent $1,203,000 dollars entertaining members of the General Assembly uh, last year. And even so, this figure is dwarfed by lobbying expenses in our neighboring state of Florida, where the where uh, 2,148 registered agents, almost twice the number we have here, spent $4 million. And in South Carolina, where 349 lobbyists spent $16 million on entertainment of the state legislature. These figures are available, again, once again, on the internet. And uh, I, will, I will be happy to provide them to you if you'll send me an email or request it. And I will. Uh, give you my email address sometime after this week. Uh, but getting back to Robert Hurd, I'll have to present to you before we have a short break for our guests. What Robert Hurd said on the, on the floor of the United States Senate regarding Washington. And I quote, he's wrong. This is his speech. Congress has always had and always will have lobbyists and lobbying. 
We could not adequately consider our workload without them. We listened to representatives from the broadest number of groups, large and small, single issue and multi-purpose, citizens groups, corporate and labor representatives, the public spirited, and the privately inspired. They all have a service to fulfill. At the same time, the history of this institution demonstrates the need for eternal diligence to ensure that lobbyists do not abuse their role, that lobbyists, lobbying is carried on publicly with full publicity, and that the interests of all citizens are heard without being special here to the best organized and the most lavishly furnished. As for lobbyists themselves, they would probably agree that their disappointments were greater than their successes. They spent many hours in considerable, considerable shoe level trying to convince 535 members of Congress of the wisdom or folly of certain legislation. They faced vigorous competition. They still bear the brunt of press criticism take the blame for the sins of a small majority of their number. But they have a job to do. And most of them do it very well indeed. It is hard to imagine Congress without them. That's well said. But I want to post it. What did he I say then? He said that to the member or two. Uh, when did he say it? Yeah, when, 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 when that? You know, I'm not really sure of the day. Yeah. Well, it's been in recent times. You know, he's been there since uh, <laughs> Hamilton pitched uh, the post to the White House. But uh, I try to give you an unbiased overall picture of what Martin is about in Washington, D.C. As I said, fortunately, we don't have those problems here. And Georgia has been very, very good. Georgia lobbyists have been, have been uh, ethical. They've done a good job. And, uh, and I think that, that they're pretty well uh, appreciated by the members of the General Assembly. Now, are there any questions? I encourage you to, to get on your computer if you're still in time and to look at some of these things because uh, otherwise, you know, the public will never know what's happening. And it's, it's not all that. You can get some, uh, you can get some uh, websites that, that point out to you the, uh, the good things that Congress does. And you should look at that. So, questions? Yes, sir. Where does uh, Abramoff's firm uh, fit into this uh, lobbying picture? You know, if Abramoff's firm is no longer, because Abramoff is well, then, but, let, let me rephrase the question. Where did it fit in? It, it was very powerful in Washington one time. It was very powerful. It was, you know, it's uh, the ethical aspects of, uh, of Jack Abramoff. Uh, Abram off. Speak for themselves. He was, he was a dishonest and he got caught. He was tried and convicted. And, now, and he took some congressmen with him. A couple of congressmen resigned their, uh, their seats uh, to keep to, to avoid the prosecution and that sort of thing. <coughs> he was not what you would call a white hat. One more question. Bob, okay. we'll be getting in the next session, we'll be getting into how lobbyists oh, yeah. work oh, to, yeah. Oh, yeah. to exert this in. Absolutely. Doing from the horse's mouth. <laughs> I would like to present to you our guest for today. On my left is Jerry Holmes, who for a number of years lobbied in the Georgia State Council for the petroleum industry, and who is about as well versed in lobbying as anybody I've ever known. And on my right, of course, is Carson Caldwell who represented uh, the Georgia Mountains and the General Assembly for 30 years. Carlson is a better legislator of the world. The 
So I think what we have here today is the lobby earth and the lobby E. <laughs>
30 years. I'm sure you've been involved with it. So in 30 years you were down at the legislature, I'm sure you were involved just a little bit. Once or twice. Chris, <laughs> uh, you soon learned a lot of I used them. They were, they were real benefits. <coughs> of course, in every profession, you've got some good ones, you've got some bad ones. But they weed yourself out pretty quick. They, the ones that uh, is not truthful with you don't last long because uh, they'll follow them pretty well uh, all the way down through there. And people just, if they ever lose confidence in them, and a lobbyist, and he's, I think, uh, Eric would agree that he's pretty well wrapped up in them. And uh, I was chairman of one of the committees in the House, and I used, I would let bring lobbyists in to let them give their side of the, uh, of the bill numerous times, and, uh, and they would, uh, a good lobbyist is very, very helpful. And uh, helping you determine just what the, 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 is in the bill and what it really does. Well, you've uh, you've been lobbying for many times, and you have lobbied some, haven't you? Don't legislators lobby when they want to see the governor or to see uh, one of the department heads? If you're on the highway, could you classify that as lobbying? Yes, I. Uh, in fact, they accused me one time. Uh, and highway department, they thought I was a, uh, an employee over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our roads was bad. I, I walked in a long time, and uh, Mr. Jim was a dear friend of mine, and uh, I know I was over there one time, and, and uh, I usually didn't have my badge on, but I had represented the badge on, and this person came up and says, are you in the general assembly? I said, yes. I said, well, I would choose work for the highway department. So, uh, and, uh, and of course, the governor, when they sent the boy out, told us one time before, but I think it was the first or second year, but anyway, it had to be the first or second year. Um, governor Sanders, he had Moody Daniel, we called him the, uh, the boy he ran or all around all the time, the roadrunner. And George Brooks, who was a representative from Old Fort County, he had this bill up. And it pertained to uh, roads and counties, head counties. And I was on the agency, and I thought, well, this is, this is really great. So Moody came by and said, Governor won't see me. Well, it went over my head. I said, so they, they kept talking, and at this time, there was a telephone, a red telephone from the speaker to the governor. And all we had to do, they just picked it up and talked to each other. He pointed all the meetings, chairmen and all of that, uh, the governor did. And uh, so he, when we came back the second time, said, have you been to see the governor? No, I did. I thought I will. And so about the third time, I said, well, I was waiting on the vote on this bill. And he said, you've got plenty of time for a bigger than a 40 vote on this bill. So I go down there. And you know, they used to ride about car. He had his uh, cufflinks and out of his shoes. And they had his feet up on the desk. Got me in the car well. I go in. And I put in for some money for the hospital over Gladwell and the airport. <clears throat> he talked to me and he said, I understand you've got some requests in uh, for the airport, your hospital. I said, yeah. And he said, well, we need to have those, you know. He talked to him that mentioned, I got up and started leaving. By the time I got the door, he said, oh, by the way, God, well, I said, we don't need that bill <clears throat> of Jordan Brooks to do it. We need that in hospitals, the money in the <laughs> I said, you're exactly right. <laughs> I go back up there and they say, what happened? I said, it's just been explained. <laughs> <laughs> well, we gentlemen have known each other for many years. Have you had any other cross swords in the legislature? I did with one, and it was with a couple, maybe, but, uh, and one of them was over the right three, because this 
fellow wrote something right for having an opposition. I, I am not was not. Didn't think we were going to have it that year and didn't. And uh, he, he just absolutely fabricated the story for Ralph. And I called him in my office and I said, I thought I was I think being up, but I wouldn't, that wouldn't go out. But uh, I got his attention pretty well, I think. But uh, you, you just can't. Uh, he was, I don't know where he's still around there. I never did have any more to, anything to do with him. He never came up to my office. Now let's talk for a minute about great lobby battles. The first thing that comes to my mind is the, <coughs> is the old W and A railroad fat fight back in what uh, 1967 was it? Yes. I think there were more lobbies <coughs> around the capital than there were Boulder Weaver in the top. You remember that? Very well. That was in the committee that I was on. That was in the state institution of Rock. Now, Bill came up, and uh, of course, I've been in the house one year. Then had to run again at the federal courts to uh, reapportion the house. So I served one year and had to run. So that was just maybe I was a freshman twice. And, uh, so I had a little problem on the first year. I wrote against on uh, ways and means. They put me on ways and means the first year. And I didn't like it much. That, that, that was, you know, that was a tax bill. I voted against the governor. But I uh, tax bill one time in there. And so they didn't want me. And the speaker called me in and said, we've got a uh, committee that I think you'd fit well on. So would you like to change and be on state institution property? And they had boards and the corrections and all that. I said, yeah, I'm fine. And uh, so I think that I was getting that, getting me off the ways and means. But anyway, I took that. He said, I'll give you secretary of that if you want it, if you come off the ways and means. I said, that's fine. So, of course, I didn't know. Him. We had the first hearing on the WNA. Over in the Senate, and uh, we walked in, and uh, of course they did. Most of them didn't know me because I was I just like a second, second year freshman, and uh, so when we got in, they said uh, secretary called Roll. Well, I called Roll. Well, everybody knew me then. The all of them. I mean, you talk about the elder men and, uh, and the southern. Let's explain what that was all about. Would you tell them that uh, what it was about the, uh, the uh, state was about to sell our railroad? Uh, yeah. The Avenue of uh, Weaver, well, Georgia still owns the railroad from Atlanta to uh, Chattanooga, to the river in Chattanooga. And they were going to sell this, this route. And uh, so, and Southern was bidding on it. I mean, was put a price in it, and the General Assembly had to uh, authorize it. Well, I, when I went over there and looked at it, I was the, the uh, vice chairman, and the chairman was for Southern. And so I decided that I was going to be for Alabama because they were came through Blue Ridge at the time. That this in this area and another thing, they was going to buy that for forty million dollars, and they put up a two thousand uh, dollar certified check. So I go back and I tell them, I said, "That's," I said, "You can't bid anything for a two thousand dollar check." I said, "No bond, no anything." I said, "I can't go along." Well, the chairman and the vice chairman called me in. And said, Carl, we all need to get together and uh, be of one mind. I said, oh, officers of this meeting. I said, well, I'm glad you come on here. I'm glad that you're going to be with me from L and N. That didn't go too well. But we, uh, we had about four or five votes that tied to 
get it out of me. And finally one of them defected and we got it out on the floor. And uh, that, and uh, you talk about logging, I lived in that, that time I stayed at the old Henry Gritty. Well, uh, Southern had their, they had a, well, the General Assembly really had a room there, if you know, 14 or And they had a lot of eggs and a few things like that that everybody came along with. And I don't know who, I don't know the farm, so. But they had this old gentleman, I don't know where he was from Kentucky or Tennessee, and he played the banjo. And so I would go up there and, and, and listen to him. And uh, they said, uh, Conway, you're, you're an Indian. They said, come up here and listen to that. Eat the food and then vote against us. And I said, well, I said, I like the music. I just don't like your bill. <laughs> and, uh, but we, we fought that. And then, to my surprise, the speaker was far the bill. But I'll never forget Tom Murphy. He was not the speaker then. And uh, he was far out in the and I forget the senator's name over there that was out of uh, I think that upper man at the time there. He, he went to the Battle of House and he called the 7th District, every representative from the 7th District, and they went and stood shoulder to shoulder with him because they were the ones that uh, had went through his district more than anyone else. And uh, we beat that with wasn't a great thing, but, uh, and they reconsidered it twice, I think, and we we'll tried it. But uh, we kept that from doing it, and then we, then we leased that. Later on, we leased that bill of that uh, to uh, Ellen M. got then, and uh, it was uh, put a 25 year lease on it. Of course, you know, I never dreamed that I'd be there when the, when the lease was up. Well, after about 20 years, here come a bill in my committee that uh, they want to renegotiate the links. Well, that's a little, you know, out of ordinary. And I said, uh, I don't know about that. And the uh, G. Hogan, was, who was chairman of the uh, property commission, he came to me and he said, uh, what are you going to do with that? And I said, I, I just don't like it. And he said, uh, well, you need to talk to the governor and, uh, and the speaker said they're leaning toward passing that. And I said, well, I just, I, I, I'm not inclined to do anything with it this year. I said, I'm going to hold it for next year. And he said, well, I said, you're going to have some pressure. And I said, well, that's fine. So I did. And I came home and I was up there in the office one day and she hoped he'd come. And this was Funny thing that, that he called me, he said, uh, Mr. Chairman, so I think I know why that they're going to do that lease. He said, I said, then said I, at first said, said, I've been to the doctor's office and said, I think I found out why they're going to do this lease. And I said, well, what's the doctor got to do with the lease of the LN Railroad? He said, well, have you heard, ever heard of fiber optic? And I said, well, I've heard of it. He said, I think that's what they want to put the fiber on you there. And I said, well, let me check it out and see. You. And so Mr. Ben Fortson was on the property commission at the time. And uh, he was a member and, and he was very vocal. Most of us some of you remember him, I know he was fine, he was uh, a handicapped person. So anyway, when he came up, the next year, Gene Hogan went and talked to these people and said, uh, uh, I think I know why you want that. He said, you want, you want to cut the uh, final rock? And they said, oh, we can do that now. And he said, well, just go ahead and do it. We'll cancel that. <laughs> bill. And he said, no, no, so we need the bill. And so they did. And uh, we helped that, and it was in the man, so we got we got more than a fourth million dollars in, in two years after we got a new bid from them. Not a lot of you, folks. Not a lot of you. Yeah. Uh, Eric, I, I really would be angry with myself if I didn't ask you to tell us what 
you remember about the three governors fight when Gene Towery died in 1946. What is it? You were there. I was there. That was before my time, but you were there. As I said, I was just 22 years old and never been in the Capitol and got hired as message clerk. The Senate and that situation exploded the first weekend of the session. Uh, it was uh, quite, a, quite a thing to see and, and not operate. You had the Talmadge folks on one side, the Thompson folks on one side, that's Herman Talmadge, Herman Talmadge and uh, Ellis Arnold saying he wanted to maintain the governor's office until a successor was truly elected and qualified. He went in. Uh, they had met in joint session, and Herman had uh, gotten right in votes. Election. He knew that his daddy was going to die. It was not really known in the public. And uh, so he got out and got the mighty boats. And uh, so I think history calls and newspaper people reported they were about 34 who popped up out of the cemetery in Delaware County. <laughs> 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 so it was thrown into the legislature to. Uh, for the election, Mr. Ben Fortune had all the election return, and they canvassed them, canvassed them right there on the courthouse wall and uh, determined that Herman would be, would, was going to be elected. And uh, it wound up being about 3 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday morning. And uh, they brought Herman in and Judge World in the total circuit. And they pushed him up the steps. I was standing right there at the rostrum. They pushed him up and was both growing. The two big strangers were lobbying. They were lobbying. <laughs> but during this process, they would, uh, one side would get those folks that in the legislature would make way on one side, they'd get them drunk. The other side would sort them up. <laughs> they would go back and forth. And it was quite a circus around there. They moved Ellis out of his office into the recovery. The Herman's crowd took over the office, changed the locks on the door, also in the mansion. And it was, people People were really uh, angry about it. There was, there was a lot of anger about it. And then somebody threw a firecracker over the, into the rotunda down there where Arnold was shot up the city. And somebody He's been assassinated! He's been assassinated! <laughs> you could think of the bedlam of folks running around bothering him to something else. <laughs> but finally it, it, it wound up that Herman was uh, elected and he took over, but then it went to the courts. And the courts ruled that Thompson should be the acting governor until the next, uh, next uh, election, which was about 18 months. Herman hit the road to, to uh, be elected in Kansas today. And I don't forget, I was at the reading clerk, and our Ella Forrester, who was in the welfare department today, came into the back of the city and he held up his hands, five to two, Thompson. <laughs> and one of the senators sitting on the front row jumped straight up and said, I'm running! I'm running! <laughs> Point A 
day you had your business license, like an oil distributor, uh, beer distributor, uh, bread distributor. And when they delivered from Port A and Port B, that, that city would confiscate that truck and arrest, arrest the driver and hold them for the uh, business license to be prepared. That was actually going on. It was about one, uh, our mind was due about $150,000 a year. So I researched the law, and there was a court of appeals case in Rockville County that said Citus A pertained for your business license. You did not have to have a business license in Port B that you distributed. Mm -hmm. So I got that introduced by Representative Burton Stice from Hamilton Court. And uh, it was a two year terms, and I got it in introduced it in one session and held it over to the next session. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, during that time, the Municipal Association was against this. They were absolutely positive against it. Ellen George was the head of the Municipal Association. And uh, I was lobbying, but the first two years that I was a lobbyist, I was called back, asked to come back into the Senate and uh, read the bills. The county got really loaded as no problem at the end of the session. And they asked me to come back in and read because I could read long bills very shortly. <laughs> <coughs> so my bill came up for passage in the Senate and it got to pass in the House. And uh, the Speaker Pro Tem then was great. He fed racing from uh, Savannah County. And the municipal association had gotten out to their people and they had, he'd gotten a call from the mayor of Pula Turkey about this bill. And uh, the court, but the Hamilton McCord was a member of the Senate at that time, the Secretary of the Senate. And he came up to the roster and said, we're going to bring up your bill, Eric. He said, but we don't want this amendment. I said, well, I can't. Do without it says he won't let the bill pass unless I accept that amendment, which was to exempt cities of 150,000 by place the ladder maker is about. So we, we passed the bill, and uh, I counted the votes on my own bill. Uh, Mark Smith, the assistant secretary, was on this side of us, and I, and I counted the votes on my own bill. <laughs> and uh, when it finally passed it, she made a motion to immediately transmit it to the House, which took it out of a prerogative of the Senate. So there were a bunch of senators in the section of the Senate's office, which was a uh, uh, meeting place to buy. And they had found out, on, they were in there having a few drinks, and came back, and they tried to call every motion in the book on it. And finally, my, my sister, Mark Smith, told Garland Bird was presiding and said, Garland, rule them out of order, says it's Eric's bill. <laughs> did, did you give an honest count? I did. Counting <laughs> votes on your own a little bit. <laughs> so I said, excuse me, I went over to the house and see Bird Stice and attempted to accept the amendments when the message got back to the house on the bill. So, uh, they told that story. A lot of time, I'm probably the only lobbyist that ever counted the hopes of one of own bills. Let me ask you this question. Uh, where did you like to lobby? In the halls, in the member's office, over the state of bones? Where, what was your preferable location to contact and lobby yeah. the state legislator? Well, I there was a saying back in those days, probably I don't know if you remember that, that it was not the 40 days of the session, it was the 80 nights. <laughs> 40 days and 80 nights. 40 days and 80 nights. So you did most of your lobbying uh, after the session was over there, the social functions and the uh, state houses, as you see, my own son. That one, Bone wasn't there at that time, but there are plenty of them. But I'm sure it wasn't Marston. No, not the parts thing. <laughs> but uh, around the capital, you still talk to people in the hall. Uh, mostly away from the capital, but you could be there. 
talking and explaining what you want to have. Norman, where did you like to be lobby? New Orleans? <laughs> yeah, right there, all right. You know, one of the best lobbyists I've seen, I guess you remember, Wilbur Hill. He lobbied for the school bus, school bus drivers and all. And Wilbur, just, he walked around this season, he kissed him. He was, he was sharp, he, and he said, I've got this little bit. He really never asked for a lot, you know, he, but he said, I want to help the Lord. and said, would you sign this bill? And he had to a sign it, you know. And uh, of course, it, 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 I don't think he ever lost the bill as long as he was there. But you know, you learn pretty quick that you don't say, well, I'm going to support you, Bill. You, you, you tell them you're going to, uh, give you that consideration because you never know what that bill is going to look like when it, when it comes out of committee or when it comes out of the house. It can be amended in the Senate. It can be really, you can get a different bill out of, out of the Senate, I mean the committee, and a substitute bill. And you, and you don't know, I mean, to tell that you're going to support it. Because I remember one time, I was a representative in Raven County, and this preacher up there, I don't remember exactly the contents of the bill that we had, that uh, Ralph and I was up there, and he, he, he was a preacher up there, and he was a good friend of mine, Ralph both. And so uh, they had some bill that they wanted me to vote for, and we told them, we, yeah, we could support that, we was up there. <coughs> so we had, it came up on the floor of the house, and one of these smart lawyers, they uh, amended it to where if you voted for it, you was really, it was, it was a reverse of what he came down the committee. And uh, I'll never forget it. He came down there and he came in my office and he was just terrified. And he said, oh, I'm so disappointed you in the mouth. He said, I, I just can't believe that you, you vote for that thing. So I knew what he was talking about. And I said, well, how are you, what did you for so much I said, well, that's what the bill does. No, you voted for me. He said, well, you voted against it. I said, yeah. I said, that's right. I said, we have to do that because it's amended. I said, it's been reconsidered. He started apologizing then, you know. He, he meant, but that's what you got to watch out for a lot. And, and uh, of course, you know, to, they can change the conflicts of the bill. You take a small body, and brother, you, you've got to watch that because they can change it. So even preachers lobby. Oh, yes, school teachers lobby. That uh, brings up the, uh, the question, I think, of, uh, of who should participate in that system. Uh, uh, there's a lot of money being spent in politics today. Uh, are we allowing too much money to be involved? Well, of course, I've been asking on that. I don't think it did that kind of thing. I would know. So I agree with you. Yeah. I don't think it was. It wasn't perfect like that. I know. You know, I remember one, uh, Dr. Flagg, he was uh, in the university system. Uh, and he was over the uh, all the Georgia Mountain Experiment Station, all the experiment stations. And, yeah. and back then, the border regions, but they just didn't like a line item. I mean, if you line item, they, they wanted their money and just leave it and we'll spend it. So you just put the money in there, we'll do this. So uh, I always would just line item it in what I wanted to, for Georgia Mountain Experience Station. Dr. Flat came over there one day and he said, Carmen, he said, please don't. And he said, don't, don't whine out of that. He said, uh, said I'm going to do what I'd say to Wilson. Uh, I said, well, I know. But I said, let me tell you, Dr. Flat, I said, uh, what happened up there? There's this farmer, this fellow took two pigs over there for him to grow out for him. And I said, uh, this fellow went back in the fall to get his pig, and uh, he grew them out. And he got there, and he 
said, this farmer looked at me and he said, well, I'm just sorry to tell you, but he says, you'll pay that. Uh, and I said, I just don't want my pay to that. <laughs> <laughs> he still remembered, he remembered that every time I ever saw it my that. But that was, uh, that was something that, you know, Bobby, they didn't, uh, they didn't the hard against any line up that she wanted to put in, in the border region. Which brings up another point, and that is that even state employees are lobbyists. Oh. And in the departments. And, and now, though, they must register. They didn't have to register. Well, we run out of time. I want to thank you, Mr. Holmes, that you have represented the call out for, for joining us here today. And I certainly enjoyed this. And uh, it's been a great congratulations to hear you tell me here. Experiences and stories. Well, it was good to see you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.